backtrack. All right, so linear energy transfer is the first concept we're gonna to try to get out of those two. Linear energy transfer, or let, just refers to the, uh, the way the radiation, the way the particle deposits energy as it's traveling through some medium, like the body, okay? If something, uh, if a particle of radiation strikes the surface of, the, of a tissue or the body and it's stopped immediately, well then it took all of its energy and put it immediately into the tissue right at that location. It did not travel a long ways through the tissue, slowly depositing energy along its way, right? Contrast that against a type of radiation that would travel long distances through the tissue, slowly depositing its energy as it travels through the tissue, okay? This is the idea of linear, linear energy transfer. It's the amount of energy deposited in tissue per unit path length of the radiation's travel. So basically all we're doing here is saying radiation has energy. We have a unit that we'll use to express that energy. And as it interacts with something, some matter like your body or the patient's body, it's going to deposit that energy into the patient. Okay? The distance over which it deposits that energy is the linear energy transfer. Okay? So let me read some things. Whereas units like the rad or the gray measure the energy deposited into per gram of tissue. So, you know, you can use the gray to say, I gave you this much radiation exposure, right? But you can't use the gray to say, how harmful was that radiation, right? We need other things to talk about that. The linear energy transfer measure allows you to talk about the harmfulness of the radiation without discussing how much radiation you received, okay? So it's just a different way of approaching it. Let measures energy deposited per millimeter or micrometer of, of travel through the body, through the, through the matter that it interacts with. As the radiation penetrates into the body, we, we are basically saying it has a starting amount of energy. How long did it take for it to dump all that energy? Okay. High linear energy transfer means the energy deposits into the tissue in a more concentrated way where low linear energy transfer means that the energy is deposited over long distances through the tissue. Which do you think is better, like intuitively right now? Depositing all the energy in one spot or letting it spread out over a large area? Spread out, right? Good. Um, that's, that's exactly the right idea, right? If you put all the energy into one spot, well, then it all is very, very concentrated and can cause a lot of damage to that, to that area, right? If you spread it out over a large area, then, that in, then it's sort of averaged across all, those, all, that, all that space, right? Less energy per, per space, you know, per unit of space. So let, linear energy transfer, is an indicator of how harmful radiation is. Um, we can use any unit of energy or any unit of distance to measure this, but we don't use just any. We could. We use kilovolts for the energy and microns for the distance measure. So it's kilovolts per micron. Micron is a micrometer or one, one millionth of one meter. So let me ask a quick question. How many millimeters are in a meter? Million. Not a million. A thousand. Th so if you speak Spanish, right, mil means a thousand, right? So there's a thousand millimeters per meter, okay? How many microns are in one millimeter? Two. If there's a million of them per meter, and there's a thousand millimeters per meter, how many microns per millimeter? 10 to the 6. Sorry, 10 to the, you, you got me off track. 10 to the 3. There's a thousand microns per millimeter. You're thinking the right things though. Because there, there's 10 to the 6 microns per meter, right? And there's 10 to the 3 millimeters per meter. So 10 to the 3 microns per millimeter. Okay, that, that went over, that's fine. Don't worry about it, that went over your head. Um, anyways. So in, take a millimeter, right? There's a thousand microns in that millimeter. That's how small a millimeter, that's how small a micron is. A very small distance, right? And so what we're measuring is, we're not measuring, but we're talking about is how many kilovolts of energy are deposited per micron of distance traveled by some, some form of radiation, okay? Particle, alpha, beta, gamma, or a photon of x-ray. 
Okay, so here, let's get let's use an example. I think the example is useful, right? So if you look at this one on the left, or the one that's now centered on the screen, we start off at the top of the screen, and we say we have an 80 kilovolt X-ray photon, an X-ray photon that has 80,000 volts of energy. Okay, it's not hard to make, right? If you set 80 kVp on your control console, then some of the X-ray photons that you'll produce during the exposure will have 80 kV of energy, okay? That's what you're doing when you set kVp on your control console, right? You're setting the energy of the X-ray beam, okay? This is discussing the energy of just a single photon in the X-ray beam. So if you set 80 on your control console, you're gonna get some 80 kV photons. By the way, also if you set anything above 80, you're gonna get some 80 kV photons there, right? What you set, you get a range of photon energies between zero and whatever you set. So if you set 100 kV on your control console, all the x-rays that you'll make will be between zero and 100 kV, okay? Why setting kV is setting your beam energy. But anyways, consider just a single photon now. We draw photons as a squiggly line because they're a wave, okay? Uh, 80 kV photon comes in and interacts with the body. And this is how it's gonna interact with the body. This photon is gonna initially travel six micrometers, okay? So six, this is the symbol for the micron. Um, so six microns, six millionths of a meter down into the tissue, okay? And then the photon runs into something, an atom or whatever, right? An electron, it ionizes something here, some interaction happens here. And you guys have learned about scattered radiation, right? So that photon scatters off in a different direction, traveling a total of eight micrometers in that direction, okay? Gets to eight micrometers and hits something else. Ionizes another atom. And then travels another 10 micrometers before it finally has lost all of its energy, okay? It's down to zero energy, it's gone now. The photon is completely absorbed, okay? This is the last spot that it made it to. So all you have to do to talk about this is, is say, how much energy did it start with? Which is what? 80, what? 80 kV. And then how far did it travel with that energy? Okay, and so you just add those numbers up. You don't have to do it because it's already done for you. There's starting energy is 80 kVp. So it's kV per micron, kV on top distance on the bottom, okay? 80 kV deposited over 24 microns of, of distance, right? Just add those numbers up when it comes to 24, okay? So your 80 kV photon made it 24 micrometers through tissue. Notice it's not in a straight line, right? It sort of bounced around. You just add up all those distances. 80 kV deposited over 24 micrometers comes out to 3.3 kV deposited per micrometer, 80 divided by 24 will get you 3.3. .3. So every micrometer that little photon traveled, it deposited 3.3 .3 kilovolts of energy. Consider an equivalently energetic alpha particle. So here's an alpha particle now. Alpha particles are not photons, they are big massive things, right? Let's say we have an alpha particle that also starts out with that same energy, 80 kVp. But this alpha particle, because it's big and massive, gets to the surface of the tissue, makes it three micrometers down, and dumps all of its energy into the first thing that it hits, okay? So now you have 80 kV <coughs> deposited over a much shorter distance. So when you look at the equation written out, 80 kV, deposited over three micrometers means there was 26.7 kV deposited of energy per micrometer traveled, okay? So which of these two deposits more energy more quickly? The alpha particle or the x-ray photon? The alpha particle. The alpha particle, right? Which one has a higher linear, linear energy transfer? The alpha particle. So which one's more harmful? The alpha particle is, right? Why is it more harmful? Because it travels a much shorter distance while it deposits all of its energy. It deposits its energy over a short distance path. Alpha particles are high linear energy transfer, where X-ray photons have a low linear energy transfer. They get to travel a long distance before they lose their energy. 
Does everyone feel okay with that? Anyone have a question? Okay. So it turns out you don't have to look at things like this and derive what the let is for each type of radiation. We just know them, okay? Because science, we've been doing this for a while, right? So we just know what the let is for certain types of particles, okay? For example, diagnostic x-rays, the let is about three. You just learned that it's about 3.3, .3, but it's, it's three roughly, okay? So 3 keV or kV per micron is how much x-rays deposit their energy as they move through tissue. Protons, which have a positive charge, big massive things, they're not an alpha particle, but just a big massive proton. Protons with 10 MeV. If keV means 1,000 electron volts, what might MeV mean? Big M. Million. M means million. Um, so in this case, million. 10 MeV protons. So a 10 MeV proton is going to have a thousand times more energy than a 10 keV proton. Okay, so this is really highly energetic, right? We make x ray photons with between 0 and 120 kV worth of energy, 1,000 volts. 120,000 volts are the biggest, most energetic photons you can make. Photons of x-ray can be made up to 250,000 volts, so 250 kV. What's up, Michael? So in the x-ray room, when we turn our kVP dial, right, we're setting the beam energy. Your kVP dials don't go above about 120, right? Does anyone's go above 120? Like, I know mine goes to like technically to 125, but it wants you to stop at 120. Um, so 120 is our maximum. That's 120,000 volts. That's the most energetic photons you can produce inside the x-ray room, okay? In particle accelerators, in, in big particle accelerators that they have, they can make particles travel so fast that they have thousands of times the energy that we can produce in the x-ray room, okay? Much, much more energetic. Um, these 10 MeV protons have a let of about four, so higher than x-rays. So the higher this number is, the more harmful it is, okay? What this number is saying is, it's saying, so the, the 10 MeV protons is saying with a number of four, it's saying that a 10 megavolt proton deposits about 4,000 volts per micron of travel, okay? If you look at the next one down, five megavolt alpha particles, MeV alpha particles, have a let of about 100. That means for every micron that a linear, sorry, for every micron that an alpha particle travels, it deposits about 100,000 volts, 100 kV per micron of travel. It's more harmful, right? Large nuclei that are used in particle accelerators can have up to 1,000 kEV per micron of, of let. So very, very harmful. Yeah. So what we make in the x-ray room out of all of the types of radiation that humans can produce, we're making very low energy stuff, right? Even though what we make is harmful to the body, um, you know, you're not going to expose people to heavy recoil nuclei, right? But you are going to expose people to x-rays. Yeah. X-rays are low on the list of things that are harmful in the category of radiation. Okay, they're still harmful, but they're very low on the list. So that's sort of a, a theme we're trying to get you to, right? Is that x-rays are harmful, but they're much less harmful than other types of radiation. Is, is there a buildup to it? Like if you're in a radiology department and there's three or four x-ray techs and radiologists and everybody's doing x-rays in a day, you're exposed to a lot more than an orthopedic center, right? Yeah, um, still relatively low. Like you're still going to stay below like our yearly limits and quarterly limits and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, you're going to get more exposure doing that kind of thing. And you know, you you know, you do a mobile radiography as an RT, and so you're doing things without shielding, right? You're doing fluoroscopy where you're hands on with the patient. That's the purpose for like the gloves and the thyroid shield and the aprons and all that stuff, because you get the extra exposure. Um, so yeah, you get more than, you know, working in an orthopedic office for sure. Um, not like so much more that you're now at higher risk for developing cancers and things like that, right? We say that radiography is still a safe job, but it's, it is more though, yeah. You paid more. Huh? You paid more? Yeah, you know, you take on a little extra risk, right? Um, okay, 
So the, the, the lesson, the takeaway, one, one of the takeaways from this linear energy transfer talk is the more penetrating a radiation is, the lower it's let. And the lower the let is, the less harmful it is, right? So saying a radiation is highly penetrating is a good thing. You want it to pass through you, right? If it stops in you, then it dumped all its energy right there, right? So highly penetrating is low let. X-rays are highly penetrating. X-rays are low let. X-rays are less harmful than other higher linear energy transfer particles. So that's one idea, linear energy transfer. Um, I have a pretty decent review video on the YouTube that I made of this. It's not like during a lecture I sat down and I recorded it in, in quiet, so it's it's nice and it's all, all all you know well explained. So if you want more on this afterward, I'm re I'm recording this as we speak, but um, I have videos for this already on my channel. Um, the next is RBE. RBE is a similar idea. Well, it's it's a similar idea in that it's a way to measure the harmfulness of radiation, but it's different than linear energy transfer. We linear energy transfer is basically take a particle, see how long, see how far it can travel before it loses all of its energy, and then add the, then you know do some division to see how much energy it deposited per distance path. Relative biologic effectiveness is exactly that. It's saying how effective a type of radiation is at causing biologic harm relative to something else, okay? So the effectiveness of a certain type of radiation in causing a specified effect or disease when compared to another type of radiation. The thing that we use for comparison uh, are x-rays, okay? So it would be no surprise to you to learn that x-rays are no more harmful than x-rays. Right, X-rays are as harmful as X-rays, okay? So the RBE for X-rays is gonna be one, okay? But uh, other types of radiation, it won't. So let, let me walk this through. Here's the formula. The answer to the RBE is you take the dose of X-rays required to cause some effect in the body. So you have to like talk about an effect, right? Uh, erythema or epilation, hair loss, right? Take some effect and say how much radiation is required to cause that effect when we use x-rays okay and then you put in the in the in the denominator of the formula how much radiation is required of some other type of radiation to cause that same effect okay so let's let's and, and then you just do the do the math and you get it you get a integer answer so let's look at this there's an example here what is the rbe for alpha radiation in causing the effect of destroying or killing half of epithelial cells so the effect is we're, we want to kill half of the epithelial cells in some, some t tissue, for example, okay? And so scientists go out and they take some mice and they expose them to some radiation, right? Um, they find that it took only two grays of alpha radiation to kill half of the epithelial cells in one mouse, okay? And in the next but equivalent mouse, they exposed it to x-rays, okay? The same cells are exposed to 250 kilovolt x-rays, and they find that it takes six grays of x-rays to kill half of the epithelial cells. So alpha radiation got it done with only two grays. X-rays got it done with six grays. You needed more x-rays, right? Okay, so then you just plug it in, right? Six grays of x-rays required to cause that effect, but only two grays of alpha radiation required. And then it's just simple. It's six divided by two, okay? And the answer to that is three. 6 divided by 2 is 3. So the takeaway is we learned that if you want to cause the effect of killing half of the epithelial cells, so that's the effect, the RBE of alpha radiation is 3. Alpha radiation is 3 times more effective at killing epithelial cells. It took only one-third the amount of alpha radiation that it, that it did for the x-rays. Okay, it took 6 grays of x-rays to do something only two grays of alpha radiation to do that same thing, right? You get more done, you get as much done with less radiation with alpha. Why would you get so much more harm or, or the same amount of harm with less radiation when you used alpha radiation? Why is it more harmful? You, you just learned it. It's, it's lead. Because it, alpha radiation has a high linear energy transfer and x-rays have a low linear energy transfer okay that's why okay so the answer to why is it more effective is the let for alpha is higher than x-rays okay so these are related right linear energy transfer is related to relative biologic effectiveness 
a radiation that has a high linear energy transfer is very harmful is going to be is going to have a high relative biologic effectiveness okay these are two things are linked I'll, I'll circle back to that in a moment here you do not have to do this math you do not have to go find some mice and irradiate them okay we've already done it and we know the numbers okay Diagnostic x-rays have an RBE of 1. X-rays are as harmful as x-rays are. Okay, pretty straightforward there. 10 MeV proteins, these are just like standard comparison particles, right? Um, there's others too. There's many, many others. I encourage you to go look up, uh, you know, the, the standard model of particle physics when you go home and look at how many particles we know about. Okay, it's a lot of them. It's not just protons, neutrons, and electrons anymore. And photons, there's a lot of stuff that we know about. But anyways, these are some of the standard ones. Photons, X-ray photons get an RBE of 1. That's no surprise. They're as harmful as they are. Protons get an RBE of 5. So what is that saying about these protons with an RBE of 5? They're harmful. Are they more or less harmful than X-rays? And how many more times harmful are they? This is it, right? With an RBE of 5? We can say that the, pho the protons, these 10 MeV protons, are five times more harmful. So that's what the number tells you is how many times more harmful it is, right? It would take five times less radiation when using the 10 MeV protons to do some harm than it would in x-rays. It would take five times more x-rays to cause the same harm that the, that the protons could cause with you know, five times less. Okay? So said in another way, the protons are five times as harmful. If you guys remember back to when we're talking about effective dose, right? We use the sievert to talk about effective dose and you had to consider how much radiation somebody was exposed to and multiply it by a radiation weighting factor, right? And we said that alpha particles had about where had a radiation weighting factor of 20. This is where we get the radiation weighting factors from. The RBE is where this is derived from, okay? Um, so alpha particles have an RBE of 20. That is saying that alpha particles are 20 times more harmful than x-rays. Again, the entire moral of this whole story is just to keep reminding you that x-rays are not that harmful when you compare them to many other types of radiation, right? It's the only type that we get to use, but it's less harmful than other types. That's the, again, the, the hidden moral of the story. All right, and then lastly, heavy recoil nuclei, big particles, 30 for their RBE, so 30 times more harmful than x-rays. Okay. So that's let and RBE. Um, and now we're going to now get into something called the dose rate. And there's a couple of uh, concepts in, uh, within dose rate. And, but let's see if we can just uh, illuminate some of this. Dose rate is saying you're going to get a dose of radiation. How long we take to give you that radiation is your dose rate. right? So it's amount of radiation over time. Okay. Think about this like, you know, when you make a setting on the control console, right, you like, for example, you set your mass, right, your milliamperage in time. I've told you things like you can set a long exposure time or a short exposure time for some equivalent mass, right? For example, if I wanted to set 10 MAS, yeah, I can, I can do 10 MAS with, with in one way, um, 100 MA times 0 0.1 seconds, right? Okay, but I could also do twice that time and half the MA. So this is 100 times 0.1 is, is 10, right? 10 mass. This is also 10 mass. 50 MA times 0 0.2 seconds, okay? They are the same amount of x-rays produced, yeah? Both 100 MA for 1.1 second or 50 MA for 0.2 seconds both makes 10 mass worth of x-rays, okay? One of them has a 0.1 second exposure, the other has a 0.2 second exposure. This one has a longer exposure time. This one will have a lower dose rate than that one, okay? So let me, let me now discuss dose rate now that I've said that. Dose rate is related to the effect on the organism. Um, you know, you get natural background radiation all the time, right? So if I asked you, you have an option. Um, just today only, I'm going to give you the option. You can get all of your natural background radiation today for the rest of your life. You can get it all today, right? And get none for the rest of your life. Would you take it? Why? 
Because you might die, right? Yeah, Maybe. We'd have to add it up and see. But it, it would be more harmful, obviously more harmful, right, if I gave it to you all at once, yeah? That's the idea of dose rate, okay? If we can spread it out over a long time, then it can be less effective, right? If I give it to you all right now, it could hurt you. But if I spread it out over your whole life, it's less likely to do that, okay? Um, no one has ever answered, you know, I'll take it all right now, you know, because it just doesn't make sense, right? Okay, good. So that hopefully illuminates the, the, the difference here. But let me give you an example here using radiation therapy, okay? So two patients both need to receive 500 milligrays of radiation. doesn't matter what, and for this, it doesn't matter what type of radiation, just 500 milligrays of radiation to treat their tumor, okay? The treatment time for patient A is 20 minutes, and the treatment time for patient B is 10 minutes, okay? So we just say how much radiation is deposited per minute. Well, for patient A, it's 500 milligrays over 20 minutes, 500 divided by 20, 25 milligrays per minute. Patient B, 500 milligrays over 10 minutes, so 50 milligrays per minute. Patient B gets more radiation per minute than patient A. The dose rate for patient B is higher. Even though the total dose is equal, patient B will be more affected. More harm will be caused to patient B because you squished all that radiation exposure into a smaller amount of time, okay? The, so another way to word this is, acute exposure is always more harmful than graduate, gradual exposure. So when you're thinking about uh, exposure times for your patients, right, you now have <laughs> two conflicting schools of thought, okay? Up to this point, when I've been teaching about exposure time, what have I been telling you to do? Make it Use the shortest exposure time, right? What is that for? Well, so why, why do we use the shortest possible exposure times? So it's better for the patient's emotion. It's not better for the, we just learned it's worse for the patient, oh, right? Worse. It's better for the patient in, in the context of it reduces the chance of motion, right? So you have two completely conflicting schools of thought now, okay? So you have to work these through on your own. Um, you have to decide if you want long exposure times or short exposure times. You just learned that the longer exposure times are better for the patient, like in, in, in the idea of dose rate, okay? But longer exposure times also put the patient at risk for moving, which if they did move, would require you to repeat the exposure, doubling their exposure, right? So you have to decide, do I want short exposure times, sacrificing dose rate, or do I want long exposure times, minimizing dose rate, but then adding in the chance for patient movement, okay? And you have to weigh these two things, right? So when a patient is not likely to move, or when there's a body part that you know is not gonna move, longer exposure times are better, okay? Lower dose rate. When the patient is likely to move, or it's a body part that cannot stop moving like the heart, then shorter exposure times are better. Okay, so now you have two schools of thought on exposure times, right? Short times for minimizing movement, long times minimize dose rate, okay? And you have to balance those two things. All right, so that's dose rate. When we discuss dose rate, that's really all you need to know what we mean by dose rate, but there's a couple other, um, uh, there's two other concepts in the umbrella of dose rate. They are called protraction and fractionation. Now, protraction is exactly what we just talked about, okay? It's, it's, it's lengthening the time of a single exposure, okay? So if you, if you pay attention to what I just said, you know what protraction is. Protraction, extending the delivery of a single dose over a longer time. Protracting the dose rate for a given total dose lowers the effectiveness of the dose. So long exposure times are better for the patient. They're less harmful to the patient than short exposure times. Example given is sort of like mine, but a little different. Two patients both receive an AP lumbar spine um, x-ray. So they get the same dose, two same size patients, right? Both are gonna get 20 mass, 20 MAS worth of x-rays, okay? Patient A, exposure time is 0.05 seconds, and patient B, exposure time is 0.1 seconds. Who has the longer exposure time, A or B? Careful. B. See, it's 0 0.05. Oh. So B has a longer exposure time. B's exposure time is twice as long, okay? So then you just do the quick math here. The dose rate for patient A, 20 mass over 0 0.05 seconds. By the way, all that's telling you is what the MA is, okay? Higher MA. Patient B, 
20 mass over 0.1 seconds, 200 MA. Patient A got more x-rays per unit of time. Their dose rate was higher. Patient A is more affected because they got twice the dose rate, okay? So protracting the dose is a one way to minimize your patient's, um, if the effect to your patients from radiation exposure. Honestly, this is true, but it's more important most of the time to minimize motion. Because when you, if you don't minimize motion, you will have to repeat the x-ray, okay? So this is theory, and then there's practice, right? Practice is different than theory, okay? So what the theory says, maximize uh, exposure times to minimize patient effect, okay? In practice, what we really need to do is minimize patient movement to minimize retakes, okay? So you have, you, again, you have two conflicting schools of thought here and you're just gonna have to just work with both of them, okay? There's no way, there's no way around it. We have both of these that we have to think about. Um, but this becomes important in, in things like radiation therapy, okay? Um, in radiation therapy, because we're giving patients, not we, but you know, the royal we, we're giving patients large doses of radiation to treat cancers, tumors, right? Um, these large doses of radiation also hurt the body, okay? So what they have to do is they have to consider, like, we want to kill the tumor, but we don't want to kill the person, right? So we have to give, we have to protract their dose over a long enough time to reduce the effectiveness of the radiation um, on the person, which also reduces the effectiveness of the radiation on the tumor, and you just hope that you can balance those two things out to get the tumor destroyed before the person dies. What they'll do is they'll, they'll protract the dose, but then the total dose will have to be higher than what, than what was originally planned for. Like if six grays of radiation would have killed the tumor, but would also kill the person, right? If we give it to them all at once, let's spread it out over a long time, but now we might have to give you eight grays in total, right? Uh, but it's just a, a made up number, so but. Standard chemotherapy, right? Right, right. It makes you, the patient sick. It makes them sick, so we have to stretch it out over a longer time, right? Because we give it to all you once, you die, right? Stretch it out over a longer time, it becomes less effective on both you and the cancer. And so we now have to give you more in total over that longer period of time. So this is one way to do it. This is when we're talking about single doses of radiation. Extending the time that you give that dose over is called protraction. Fractionation is almost the same thing, but in the context of giving several doses. For example, in radiation therapy where you have to give several treatments. They get a treatment one week and next week and, and so on, right? Fractionation is breaking the total delivered dose into several separated discrete portions. This word discrete, what does it mean to you? Like what's it usually mean? Quiet, Quiet right? Um, not talked about, right? And, and we're going to be a little discreet about that. You know, we're not going to talk about that. You know, discrete in, in, in science and medicine doesn't mean that. Discrete just means like, um, uh, chunked up, individual chunks, right? If I say, uh, you know, the uh, the atoms are made of discrete pieces. What I'm saying is the atoms are made of individual parts. They're not continuous. They're not just one continuous blob, okay? So discrete means chunks of things, portions. Uh, yeah. That's fine. Just be real careful. Yeah. You know what you're doing. Thank you. Okay. When we're talking about things like radiation therapy, fractionation is the way it's done. Because like, you can't give somebody the amount of radiation they would need to kill the tumor all at one time. You can't even give them to them all in one sitting, right? Even if you protracted it over like a, the full day, it's still so much that it would kill the person, okay? So you have to uh, fractionate it. You have to chunk it up into, into different exposure times. Fractionation reduces the effectiveness just like protraction does, right? Just think about it, so it's protraction, but now it's protraction with individual chunks, right? Rather than just one long thing, we're now chunking it up over a long time. Extended delivery times, protracting, as well as separation to allow recovery. The total dose calculated must be higher to compensate for that. So let's give an example. Example, 4,000 milligray, or just four gray, if you like. Delivered in one dose will kill a cancerous mass, but as you hopefully know by now, more than one gray can kill a person, right? In fact, four gray is what we call the LD5030. It's lethal, it's the lethal dose to half of all people, okay? Um, so if you give a, a, a group, a 
group of people or, or you know a big cage of mice if you all give them if you give them three and a half to four gray right and uh, you come back in a month half of them will be dead okay that's the LD 5030 we'll talk more about that later but th that's the deal right four gray is a lot enough to kill cancer but also enough to kill a person it should be enough to kill a person if it's enough to kill cancer because cancer is just body tissue right just run away body tissue okay um, but anyways so that would kill the person so don't, don't do that so we now chunk it up okay we chunk it up fractionated into 10 doses but because we chunked it up that four gray is not going to cut it anymore it would now need maybe six gray okay six gray is now required to kill the cancer however the patient will survive this dose because of the recovery periods between doses 10 doses at 600 milligray, not 60. You guys catch that? It's a typo. Don't give them 60. That'd be 100 doses at 60. Anyways, the point is, if you chunk it up, fractionate it, you can uh, keep the organism alive long enough to treat the um, pathology, the cancer. This is uh, sort of, trying. they're trying to show this graphically. This is showing... Um, the effect on the body and the cancerous tissue over three radiation doses. So let me step up to the board and I'll sort of point to a few things. Horizontal axis on our graph shows you dose periods, dose one, dose two, dose three, and vertical axis on the graph shows you the number of cells alive before and after those periods. Your two plotted functions are the, are the, are the solid line showing you cancer cells, uh, and the, the dotted line showing you the body cells, okay? So if you look at, um, so before dose one, you'll have 100% of everything alive, okay? Body cells, cancer cells, all are alive. They're all gonna be stuffed into this one column here. At dose one, after dose one, you get cancer cells and body cells coming down to less than 100%. So 100% up here, they fall down to somewhere low. They're not at zero, because that's zero down here, okay? But so cancer cells and body cells are all are damaged, okay? Now there's gonna be a repair, a time between dose one and dose two. Doesn't matter how long it is, but there's some time between the first and second dose. During that time, both cancer cells and normal cells were, were hurt. During that time, cancer cells shown in the dark green line are gonna regrow, okay? They're gonna get, we're gonna get more of them. That's, that's them coming up here this way, growing, right? But the body cells are going to recover more. Okay, that we, we've learned that body cells, like normal body tissue cells, recover faster than cancerous cells after radiation exposure. So at the point where we get to dose two, the body cells have recovered almost to 100%, but the cancer cells have not recovered to 100%. They haven't recovered anywhere close to where the body cells have recovered to. We give you dose two now, okay? At dose two, Cancer cells fall to here, body cell counts fall to here, okay? Then we get you a recovery period between dose two and dose three. Well, cancer cells recover, but now there's less of them, okay? Body cells recover, they're still less than there were before, but the body cells are recovering more than the cancer cells each time, okay? Then we treat you at dose three. At dose three, cancer cells go to zero, okay? The body cells, do not go to zero. So after dose three, the cancer cells are all gone, okay? The body cells are still there and alive. The cancer cannot regenerate because it's gone now, okay? Cancer's gone. The body cells, however, can regenerate and they'll just go back to 100% and the person will survive, okay? This, is, this, this graph will plateau and this person will get to stay alive as long as you don't give them any more you know, radiation therapy treatments, right, just to destroy it any of their cells. Okay, so there you go. You have a way of talking about fractionation and how it can destroy both cancer cells and body cells, but the hope is that cancer cells die quicker than the body cells and they don't recover as much. And eventually, you keep treating them, both of them keep decreasing. You destroy all the cancer cells before you destroy the body cells, then you allow the body to recover. So that's important to know, right, that it's harmful to both, both the patient and the cancer cells, right, because the cancer cells are part of the patient. You have to hurt the patient, too. And, um, you know, uh, fractionation, though, allows us to do that without destroying the organism. Okay.
let's keep going now. You guys are doing good. What's going on here? Um, a couple of minor ideas here as I, as I finish these, these, these set of notes up. Oxygen enhancement ratio. It's pretty straightforward. Just recall that um, in the presence of oxygen, O2, um, such as what might occur in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, the production of free radicals and toxins from radiation exposure go up. Remember when we talked about the production of hydrogen peroxide from water? You needed a free oxygen molecule nearby. You needed an O2 molecule nearby for the free radical hydrogen to attach to. Well, more oxygen molecules nearby means more free radical hydrogens can attach to more of them, which means more H2O2 molecules can be produced. So in the presence of oxygen, high oxygen environments, you have more possibility for, for cell harm. Okay, um, and you have high oxygen environments in your lungs and in, in certain cells of your body. Um, and then of course, in the presence of things like hyperbaric oxygen chambers, oxygen therapies, radiation uh, exposures are more harmful. That's all you need to remember. Radiation is more harmful when you are in a high oxygen environment, okay? Okay. That summarizes what I need to talk about here. Let me now jump over.